now. And uh, so feel free to start whenever. So this yeah. is the Doctor Who panel, just to make sure everyone's in the right room. Um, there are also panels going on Discord, but this is our only current Zoom panel right now. So um, hopefully you're in the right room, but it looks like everyone is and more people are coming in, which is exciting. So I'll hand it off to them and I'll just turn off my mic and my camera. Um, okay, uh, he's, he says uh, it's waiting, it says uh, waiting for the host to let him in. So he should have, he should have, uh, uh, he should have. Um, Ace and uh, Chris, but you're my favorite um, Doctor Who YouTubers. Oh, stop it, mate. Thank you. Do not discriminate. There's a lot of good Doctor yeah, Who YouTubers here. There's too, there's too many Every, good ones everyone is, everyone is welcome. Everyone is. Amen to that. Everyone's I loved. It. I think so, Ainsley back there is my favorite. Um, do you guys think that we should just start introducing ourselves and then um, and then just uh, just hope hope that he can join by the time hope that he's let in by the time uh, uh, we finish. Just sure. to check, did he get the Saturday Zoom link or the Sunday? Because I know some I people have been clicking the wrong one. Well, it's the same. It's the same one that I sent to everyone. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. It's the because I just I just did like a group email. Mm -hmm. um, so we should have the right uh, Saturday one. Okay, just want to double check. Is is there a way to like can can we like add him like through his email or does he need to join on his own? Because he he said he joined, but I don't know I don't know where he is. Uh, like I don't know why he wouldn't be here. Just while you're sorting that out, don't forget I've got to I've got to um, I've got to jump out around 25 past because I'm I've broken out of a live stream to come and do this. <laughs> Dare you have a life outside of this? What is wrong? No, it's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> uh, I've, got, I've got a channel running out on YouTube right now, and I'm I'm not there. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so I think we should just get started with introductions, and while that's happening, I'll try to I'll try to troubleshoot uh, with with Paul. Um, so uh, I guess I so so we'll just we'll just go in the order that I see the I see the people left to right on my screen. So uh, so to start would be Jason. Hi there. Okay, I'm I'm Jason Clifford. Um, I am a crew member for Phantom Events. They're a UK based. Uh, Doctor Who um, convention organization, um, but they also um, have a publishing arm. And what we've been doing is obviously lockdowns meant that we can't put live events on for um, our uh, fans in the UK. So we've taken to um, taking Phantom online. And for the last two months, we've run 10 very successful um, Doctor Who conventions and a number of spin off events from that. So uh, it's been quite a been quite a learning curve. Um, we've we've basically um, probably generated probably in excess of eighty hours unique um, interview material just over the last couple of months. Uh, great. So uh, next is Jay. Hello, I'm I'm Jay. Actually, I make videos about whatever tends to interest me in the time. Uh, I have no real rhyme or reason to anything I do, and. Uh, this seemed like fun. I've been a fan of Doctor Who my entire life, since literally in my life, because my dad is a fan, Doctor Who predates my episodic memory. Uh, he showed me Doctor Who as a baby. I hear these stories. I don't remember that. So it's, it's fun to be here. Cool. So next is uh, Nathaniel. Hey, everybody. My name is Nathaniel Wayne. Oh, wow. um, I am... I have multiple YouTube channels. The relevant one would be Council of Geeks, where I talk about a variety of geeky topics, although Doctor Who is the thing that I have by far devoted the most time to and will probably continue to into the future. Uh, cool. So next we have George. Uh, yeah, I'm George. Uh, also known as this Creeper. I'm a YouTuber, again, Primarily focused on Doctor Who, um, at least for the last you know two three years. Um, I look at sort of the production news for the following series. Talk about you know try and break that down. But I also do stuff like reviews, drunk reactions of certain episodes. Um, 
what else do I do? I do classic reviews sometimes as well. I spice things up. I don't know. Um, just Doctor Who content. You know, we're, we're waiting like eight months till the next episode. So I've got to try and do something, anything. Um, I've also had a message from Crispy Pro whose computer's crashed and just says cover for me. So uh, he's Australian and he also does YouTube. That's, I'll let him, <laughs> I'll let him do the rest when he wanted to get his computer back on. But uh, yeah, it's got to... Okay. <laughs> he's doing everything oh, he can. Excellent. If, if he can rejoin, uh, if he can rejoin later, then I'll just have him do his introduction uh, whenever he can get. So uh, good. next we have D Dominic. <laughs> Hello there. Well, I am a cosplayer, but mostly focused on Doctor Who. Uh, I'm known on YouTube as Who Chaser, and uh, that generally make a lot of, well, obviously Doctor Who content. Um, I've done cosplay guides for all of the, the Doctor Whos. Uh, I'm also in the DW 2012 fan film as uh, the incumbent Doctor, aka the Purple Doctor. So uh, it's a nice way to spread my rings, I guess. <laughs> uh, and also been fan since 2005, but my first doctor was Colin Baker. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's me. Uh -huh. uh, so next, uh, la last uh, as well. Uh, hi all, um, otherwise known online as Mr. Tardis, Mr. Tardis Reviews. I've been talking about Doctor Who online for uh, 10 years and one month. Uh, so, uh, way too long. I've been talking about this way too long. Uh, but I'm mainly known as that guy who does incredibly, ridiculously in-depth Doctor Who content, like a feature-length Dalek shot-by-shot -shot analysis, reviews that are longer than the episode themselves. Basically, too much time on my hands, but I'm very happy to be here. And great to see this, this lovely lot of people in this subwave network. <laughs> Beautiful. Great. So uh, I guess we can get started with the first question. Uh, what uh, some of you touched on this? What initially was the thing that got you hooked on Doctor Who? Uh, and anyone can jump in. Uh, basically, we can go in any order. Oh, there's Crispy back. Um, okay. So since Crispy's here, uh, let's have him introduce himself first, and then we'll get on with that question. Uh, Hey, uh, Crispy, we're just doing introductions now. So, um, uh, so like, if you could just introduce yourself. Oh, did everyone go through their introductions? <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we literally just finished yeah. them. <laughs> well, I just um, had to fix my internet because I live in Australia and internet's not that great here. But anyway, hello everyone. Um, I am Crispy Pro. I make videos on Doctor Who theories, discussions, and like the occasional Taylor Swift Doctor Who parody. And that's pretty much it. And your actual name is Oscar. Yeah, that's me. That's I saw on one. Twitter. Yeah. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead in the, the first, I'll repeat it for Crispy um, since, uh, since he wasn't there. So what initially got you hooked on Doctor Who? I'll, I'll um, take... I oh, yeah, no, you go. I'll take it first because I think I probably have one of the weirder <laughs> ways that I got into it. Um, so I knew about Doctor Who when I was growing up, uh, living in the U.S. You know, it was on like PBS. And I remember even seeing like a bit of an episode because I had a friend who who watched it, but I couldn't get into it. I'm like, I have no idea what's going on. And I just never even bothered trying. And I knew that it came back, but I wasn't watching it. However, when I had my honeymoon, from my marriage in and we were in London and we were there for a week which is the perfect amount of time to do a city like London because it's long enough to do all the tourist stuff but also have some downtime so you're not just rushing from thing to thing and during a bit of downtime she she took a bath and I started flipping through channels and I stopped on an ood and I the reason that grabbed me it Boy, this is really, even by Doctor Who standards, this is nerdy. I stopped because it, to me, it looked like a mind flayer from D&D. &D. <laughs> so for that reason, I started like, okay, what is this? And I caught the last half hour or so of the Satan pit. And the moment at which David Tennant is dangling down into the pit and he goes, it could be miles ago yet, or it could be 30 feet, kind of pauses. I could survive 30 feet. The instant I heard that, I'm like, I need to get into this as soon as I get back home. So once we were back in the States, I 
through Netflix on disc, because I'm old, um, I, I caught up on the series. And then starting with series four, I watched as it airs. And I've been hooked ever since. And I'm slowly catching up on classic. There's a lot I still need to catch up on. Okay, you say you're old. I'll, um, I'll, make, I'll make you feel very young right now. So my very first memory of Doctor Who is episode four of Planet of the Spiders back in 1970, probably back end of 73, early part of 74, which is the earliest memory of Doctor Who that I've got. Um, and I'm absolutely convinced it's why I'm absolutely petrified of spiders in my life. Uh, the Doctor that made the biggest impact and made me a Doctor Who fan is Tom Baker. Um, pretty much from the moment he came on screen, I was hooked and I've been hooked ever since. So I can't. Hey, go um, into it. Can I um, can I just uh, restart my Zoom a minute so then I can uh, fix the uh, sound because it's really uh, quiet for me. So can I restart my Zoom? Uh, yeah, we're we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and continue with this, but you can uh, you can do that if you want to. Um, so Dominic, you were going. Yeah, so I kind of got into it a bit, sort of unusually, but sort of typically at the same time. Uh, my first experience of Dog 2 was actually seeing uh, the Colin Baker speech in Trial of a Time Lord when I was uh, flicking through UK Gold back in uh, 2000, early, way early 2005, maybe late 2004. It's distant past at this point. But uh, yeah, and uh, I just saw him doing the, the speech and I was just like, this is really cool. What is it? And I never ended up uh, catching up on what came later until I heard about it coming back. So if Eccleston um obviously taking over the reins i was very interested from that yeah. i was very interested from the uh, from the get-go really because i'd already had that prior experience but of course it was completely different in 20, 2005 to what we've already seen so i ended up binge watching the classics simultaneously as well so uh had a very uh mixed up childhood when it came to dog two but it was all really good <laughs> hard to think of two doctors more different than colin and yeah, uh, Christopher Eccleston. Oh, Who wants to go next? I, I can jump in if, if need be to fill a gap. Um, my dad watched uh, Doctor Who when he was a kid, sort of with Tom Baker, a little bit of Peter Davison, sort of went off it around uh, Colin. Um, and he was watching it sort of when Eccleston came back 2005. I was, I was only four years old then, um, but my first memory of Doctor Who was the sort of, it still it sort of burned into my brain as the shot of the Dalek sort of elevating up the uh, staircase. I remember turning around screaming and running upstairs. And about a year later, I then sat down and watched both series one and two with my dad. And then, yeah, just yeah, loved it ever so since. Like, now I'm not scared about people who watch Doctor Who. They're the cutest guys. Yes. Hello. Justin. Hello. 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 <laughs> um, I'll go next. So um, I got into Doctor Who quite late in the game, and I think the latest compared to um, all of you guys. I was just um, having dinner at my um, auntie and uncle's house, and in the background was um, the the episode The Lodger with James Corden, that that one that everyone remembers. Um, <laughs> And I like remember just hearing um, the the like opening scene of that episode where um, I think is, is it that girl like at the top of the staircase being like, "Can you help me? Can you help me?" I'm like, "What is this? Like, what is happening right now?" I had no idea. And then I tuned in the week um, after for the Pandorica opens, and everything happens in that episode. And I was like, "I'm so confused by this weird and wonderful show that I have to tune in." And I was hooked ever since. And you know, went back and watched some. Um, you know, David and Chris, and I still need to watch a lot of classic Who. So I'm with you on that one, Councillor Geese. Got a lot of lot of um, episodes to get through, but um, yeah, and I, you know, just been hooked ever since. Uh, I'll step in if, if if that's all right with everyone. So I, I got into Doctor Who at the same time around millions of other people did, and that was in 2005 when the show came back. Uh, I'd never watched the classic series, with the exception of a memory that I have. Uh, running out of my grandmother's front room when I was four years old because of the cliffhanger for the Santaran experiment when the potato head was revealed and I 
ran out the room screaming, not knowing what <laughs> I was watching. Uh, but then uh, I started watching in 2005 uh, with Rose and the End of the World. Uh, but it was actually like really Doctor Who confidential, the BBC Three sister show, companion show about the behind the scenes that made me really get invested in the show and the process behind it. And like directors like uh, A. Rosalyn and Joe Ahern, writers like Russell T. Davis, uh, and just that this really big ambitious show was just showing on like BBC One in this time slot with, when there really wasn't anything else like it at the time, at least nothing that I was really aware of. And I've been hooked ever since. And it was Christopher Eccleston's run as the, the Doctor that got me so invested in that series. Uh, so was that everyone or is, did someone not go yet? Okay, I guess that was everyone. Um, so uh, next, uh, who's your favorite doctor? Uh, you can pick two if you can't pick one. And uh, second part of that question, are there any doctors you don't like and why? Well, I've already said it's Tom Baker. Uh, and... Um, I've got to say probably as well, um, Peter Capaldi, um, because I think he brought some gravitas back into the role for me. I, see I'm, I think I'm an old school Doctor Who fan, I think. And, and um, you know, when you've grown up with Tom Baker um, and then Peter Capaldi comes along and blows, blows you away really, because he's brilliant in the program, he's brilliant. Jodie's brought her own feel to it, but for me, Peter in the new, in the new series is the best. Um, and there's no Doctor I dislike, even Peter Cushing, um, because they, they're all their own individual people and that's exactly how they should be. I have to agree with that. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, I just want to say that I agree totally with Jason. My favourites are Tom and Peter and they're just the top for me because, um, as I said, Peter has that gravitas as Tom did. Uh, Tom has basically played himself and it worked perfectly. And uh, Peter has just has that real powerhouse is a real powerhouse of an acting force and uh, whilst the characterization may have been a bit all over the place there's something special about his doctor that just really resonates with me especially in series 10 and i just love his doctor really that for me is uh, my personal favorite renditions of the character um i would say i don't really have a least favorite doctor i as they're they're really their own characters and i don't think you should really have a at least favorite they're all in have their own aspects that some might prefer and some might not prefer but uh everyone's done extreme extremely well in putting their own touch to the role so i think we're starting a bit of a trend here my favorite is is peter capaldi which is actually <laughs> kind of funny because i i didn't fall it took me longer to love him than most of the other doctors because most doctors i can pinpoint a moment when oh yeah i'm on board and it's usually pretty early on into seeing them capaldi it wasn't really until series nine that i started to warm to him but what i love about what he does uh dominic you kind of said he was all over the place i actually feel very strongly if you watch straight through there is an arc to mm. his portrayal of the doctor in a way that I actually don't think anyone else has done. I've never seen the character develop within the same generation, uh, regeneration, the way that Capaldi did it. And it was a way that <laughs> made sense to me and I loved watching. As far as least favorite, what I would say is the two that I have a hard time connecting with and just don't resonate with me as much are uh, Davison and the War Doctor, uh, John Hurt, both of whom are good. I just have not found a way to clue in to either of them. With the War Doctor, it's hard because it's not as much material to, you know, to latch on to. But I, every time I watch a Davison story that I haven't seen before, I'm keep out. Maybe this will be the one where like he clicks for me, and I'm still hoping it hasn't happened yet. But and he's still good, and I have friends who love him and have explained to me why, and it makes total sense. But I just haven't made the connection with his Doctor yet. I mean, can, um, can I um, can I um, say what my favorite doctor is as well? Or? We'll we'll do we'll do like questions and comments and all that at the end. Uh, for now, we're just gonna hear from all the the panelists. Uh, uh, can yeah. I just can I just jump in? Um, yeah. Um, again, following the trend, Peter Capaldi's definitely up there. Um, I've got to be a bit cliche and probably go for like Smith as well. I think because of the way I sort of went with Doctor Who, it's only been more recently that I've got into classics. And I do need to watch a hell of a lot more to form like proper judgment. 
Um, and in terms of like a, like a least favorite or doctors, I don't, there's no doctors that I don't specifically like. There's just some that I maybe just don't connect as well with. I'm not saying like they're bad. They're still, you know, it great. It's just like, it's like, who do you, who do you love more out of, you know, like which, which is the shiniest diamond in a sense, like they're all good, but which one's slightly better and which one's slightly, you know, so I don't know if, I, if to be picky, probably, yeah, Peter Davison. John Pertwee I don't connect too much with don't shoot me but like again I need to see more stories so maybe I'll be swayed in my opinion um but yeah no I, it's more of a not connecting as much with opposed to um like not liking them yeah I'm one of the few who does represent Peter Davison as one of my favorites uh, along with Eccleston as well because there's the emotional attachment oh, yeah. to Eccleston but Davison and Eccleston I think under like much like Capaldi do undergo arcs over the course of their series and their seasons uh, where Davison is the doctor who is who really wants to try and do the right thing, but is just kind of so insecure that he he has so little doubt that he's able to do it. And I find that actually really endearing and quite humanizing and noble in a way that really contrasts with the egotistical Tom Baker and Colin Bakers that are like he's sandwiched in between. I think he really stands out during that era, especially for the Caves of Androzani, which is one of the best stories in my opinion. But I also love Eccleston as well, because he has got this very clear arc from Rose to the parting of the ways where he's a, a traumatized survivor of a war and he's trying to get over that. And he's trying and he's humanized by Rose over the course of that series. And I think it's that series alone it just works as a standalone drama. Mr. Tardis, you speak so well. It's it's very nice to hear. Oh um, I, I guess <laughs> keep talking and act like you you've got authority. Um so basically um, for me, I, 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 like, I change this answer all the time. Like, I, I'm never really sure as to who. Um, I, I like my first one was of, like Matt Smith. Um, and so I have that connection to Matt Smith. But I had a like a, a surreal experience with Doctor Who um, at the at the Doctor Who World Tour. I was um, fortunate enough to like film with the BBC, do a couple of promotional yeah. things. And so we, we watched Deep Breath, Peter Capaldi's first one. I love that episode. And then about 20 minutes afterwards, one of the folks from the BBC is like, hey, come, come backstage, you're gonna meet Peter. I'm like, what? Like, when, 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 do you, when do you watch someone's first ever episode as the doctor and then meet said doctor? Like, that, it was unreal. And then, you know, I walk in, like, he's not there. I'm like, oh, okay. And then I turn my back, he's like, hello, Crispy. I'm like, what? What's all this about? What's going on? But he's calling me Crispy. Um, and so for that, like, I have a huge, huge bias to Peter Capaldi. Um, but then Peter Capaldi said I look like Matt Smith. So I've got all kind of confused mixed signals as to who my favorite doctor is. Um, and no, I don't dislike any um, doctor. I think Ace said it best when, you know, like you're comparing different, different diamonds here. Like, you know, they're all bloody brilliant. Um, yeah. Anyway, little story for you all. <laughs> I don't like 13. I'm going to be the first one to say it. Hell yeah. Um, no fault of Jodie, as far as I can tell. I just don't think she's been given the material to yet. I hope she goes to Big Finish after her run so that mm. she can get some proper experimental stuff going on. Because I, you know what? I wouldn't have liked Colin based on his, uh, his TV episodes on, on their own. Uh, you know, I, I would have just probably... Despise is a strong word. I would have, I would have avoided him. But um, his Big Finish stuff blew me away and as a result he's probably one of my favorites and I don't think that Jodie's got really that opportunity yet to uh, to to shine I think her stories are not great <laughs> um yeah I was I was excited about her casting but uh I, I, I've not I've not enjoyed I've enjoyed one episode of her so far and that was uh the haunting of the place of the name I can't remember the last the lone side Phil that's the one. Nice. My favourites are uh, Paul McGann and, and Colin Baker, although that answer may be completely different tomorrow. <laughs> because it, it was probably different about a month ago. Oh, um, oh Paul. Um, is, is that you, Paul, uh, Casey? Uh, it's Paul's iPhone. Darius Paul's iPhone. Hello. Hey, hey Paul. How, how's it going? Good, thank you. Can you can hear me? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so we're just, um, so you can introduce yourself since we've, uh, we've done that already. And the current question we're on is, uh, who's your favorite doctor and are there any doctors that you don't connect with that much? Okay. So I'll introduce myself. So my name is Paul Casey. Um, I've played monsters and creatures and aliens on, uh, the new series of Doctor Who. So for the last 12 series, um, on and off my favorite doctor. Uh, if I was to have to choose one, would be David Tennant. Cool. I just, I just, I think because I worked with him for such a long time for three series, um, and it was, just a, it was just a great time for me on Doctor Who at that point. Uh, does everyone gone on this question? Cool. So uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna skip a few of these just so we can get quickly into into um, uh, talking about like the timeless child stuff like that because I know that's that's what a lot of people want to hear about. Can I um can can I show uh, my um, video to show you guys uh, my mask? Uh, can can you uh, can you uh, do that in the chat? Um, so uh, so the last episode. Uh, sorry, the last question of this this section is, um, uh, what's your elevator pitch to people who want to start watching Doctor Who but they haven't yet, and like what what episode do you think they should start out with? Okay, so I I have my and I can actually even tell you this is how I've gotten my partner into it slightly. She's actually not that big on sci-fi, so the fact that she agrees to watch it at all, I consider this uh, a success. So what I've said is um, to use Blink as a test episode. And people debate me on that because they're like, it's not representative of what the show is usually like. And I'm aware of that, but it's an episode that is completely standalone and introduce all of the concepts and the elements. And rather than having you, forcing you to figure out who the doctor is right off the bat, you get a story that works completely in and of itself. And you get this tease of the doctor. And you and hopefully they then go, ooh, I want to watch more of that. The reason I say to use that as a test bubble is because I want to tell people to start with series one, but I'm, I can't in good conscience because the front end of series one especially feels so unrepresentative of what the show became in terms of tone and everything. And there's a bunch of stuff that got dropped very quickly in terms of tone and feel of it that I worry will put people off before they get much further. So my suggestion has been watch Blink, Get, and if that intrigues you, go to series one and move forward, realizing that you saw something that will be kind of what you're working up to and get over some of the rocky stuff at the start of series one. <laughs> I, I find it difficult to argue with that, really. Um, I mean, your perspective of seeing it from do, using Blink as a test episode I hadn't actually thought of that. So that's really good because usually people say uh, to watch Blink and I was one of the people that's like, okay, so it's not got much Doctor in. It might be a little bit, mm. but yeah, it does have a lot of intriguing points. Um, I mean, personally, the story that I would have said to start on is, of course, Rose, predictably, but mainly because that's just the entry point that everybody would want you to start on. And uh, I do feel that series one, it would take a while, it might be, a bit different compared to uh, a lot of other series of Who is very much, it gets you going. And it's sort of did the tone just sort of blends as you go along. And I just feel that that combination of Eccleston and Piper really just drew me personally in. And I would just hope it does the same for others as well. I, if I could, yeah, I think, I, I, I agree. I think the one, I love the idea about starting with Blink as a sort of standalone. That's brilliant. I never thought about that. In terms of starting from like series one, I'd always say like, if you're determined and you're like gonna binge it and you got a lot of time, like, yeah, start with series one, start with Eccleston. My more controversial mind decided, wants to go towards, and <laughs> hear me out, start with series 11. The reason being, I found that a lot of people who maybe never watched the show before who tuned in for series 11, um, people I know in real life or whatever, you know, watched it through there and because it sort of threads you through quite slowly in terms of it takes an episode to introduce a TARDIS, it takes a series to introduce an old villain like the Dalek. If you start with series 11 and you like that, 
you'll absolutely love the more challenging and more, more complicated and enjoyable um, stories that have come in years before it. You start with something that's sort of standard and it tells what Doctor Who's about. It showcases what Doctor Who's about. But, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not amazing, but it's not terrible. It's sort of just sort of kind of in the middle. If people like that, then they might, they're, they're definitely going to love what came before it. So I think, I, I don't know, with it being more recent, it's more like, yeah, watch, watch that series. And if you like that, then go back to like start a tenant or start a Smith or, you know, that's kind of how I've pitched it and it seems to have worked. So I think that's where I'd go, despite how uh, controversial that opinion might be. I, I actually would, I would actually agree with you there because the the woman who fell to earth episode doesn't even have a set of opening titles, doesn't even class itself as Doctor Who. Um, it was a big reboot anyway, and I think it's as good a place as any for somebody to start. The Eccleston era has grown on me. Um, I reevaluated it three or four months ago, and actually, I hated it when it first went out. I adore it now. I think it's brilliant. So uh, I think time ages a lot of things, and I think we've, as, as we change our habits of being fans, I think our tolerance has changed. So, um, but I like the idea of that eleven, uh, uh, that, that series eleven is a starting point. I like that. Yeah, I think you could introduce um, a, a friend or or someone you want to get into the show based on the beginning of a showrunner, like series one, series five, or series eleven. Series five might be a good starting off point because it quickly introduces the whole time travel element of the show. And Amelia Pond, Amy Pond, is such a good surrogate character to see the Doctor through this lens, this fairy tale lens, that it's, it's, it's more of an interesting introduction than Rose, but it's also not so complex to the premise and the heart of the show that it's alienating. It's, it's really well explained as to who, this, who the Doctor is, the, his relationship with time and space, and just the, the whole tone and vibe of Series 5. As, as uh, I think Crispy said earlier, the Pandorica opens is, uh, the end of that series is very full on though, so that might be difficult to get them in series five and then just watch series five from beginning to end without a bit of context but i think series five is a really good introduction i think it's a bit more immediately engaging than rose or the woman who fell to earth but you gotta you gotta cater to the crowd and read the room do they like gothic horror or then maybe just get them to watch the unquiet dead if they like space action something like the ghost monument might be a good introduction uh, it, it, you just gotta play to the crowd really yeah, I completely agree with that. Absolutely. So when it, when it comes to just a general pitch, uh, you know, start with series one, start with Blink or start with, you know, start with one of the popular classics. Um, but when, it come, when you know the person that you're recommending it to, there are so many peaks to choose from that cater to everyone else's interests because that, that's, the, that's it's why I love it so much. There's I love all different kinds of stories and all of them are within Doctor Who. So, uh, you know, I might recommend certain people, I mean, there are certain people in mind that I would start on the Big Finish Audio Master or, or Davros, which are very big departures from what you might get from a lot of the new series, but uh, some of the, like, I think some of the smartest shows, uh, smartest uh, stories that the show has to offer. Um, with a lot of people, I might start them on uh, Seeds of Doom, which is my favorite classic serial, and it's like, I think representative of, of what most of the show is like. If you don't like Seeds of Doom, you probably won't like the most of Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah, but, no, uh, yeah. I, f I feel like, you know, uh, all of us are saying like, it comes down to the kind of individual we are pitching to. So like, as like, I didn't even consider series 11, but then when A said, I'm like, damn, like that is quite a good starting point because I feel like Chris Chibnall tried to make the show more accessible after you know Moffat's timey wimey stuff that you know was a bit can, could be a bit jarring for the for the general public, um, and you know series eleven definitely looks looks very now looks very Netflixy very sleek very clean, um, and so you know if if people do do get into that they would definitely you know go back and and enjoy Eccleston and Tennant and Smith and Capaldi, um, and then you'd be like oh my gosh there's we've got this wealth of classic who so I feel like it's just you know. If if you if you can get them over that first barrier, being like, okay, I'm I'm intrigued, then then you you've won, you've converted them. They're one of us now. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, has everyone uh, has everyone gone for that one? I think so. 
Um, so okay, so now I wanna I wanna skip ahead to part three because that's where I feel like the the uh, like the heart of the discussion is. So how would you guys say the the Chibnall era compares to the Davies and Moffat eras and like um, and like like the quality of the show under under either like all three of them. It, like in New Who, yeah. Every, everyone's too scared to talk now. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. I think we're all just incredibly polite and don't want to be interrupting everyone. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm terrified. Yeah. No, I am terrified. <laughs> if, if someone else starts talking while I start talking, I might look rude. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll open it up because I'm pretty vocal about this in general anyways. I, on paper... I appreciate a lot of what Chibnall is trying to do. And actually with series 11, particularly he did structurally a lot of things I had been saying I wanted the show to do to, to not have any returning villains for an entire series to do mostly standalone episodes, to drop the series arc, at least for one series. And yet I watched series 11, which did all those things and I still didn't really like it. So for me with Chibnall, there's a clash of what I know he's trying for most, not all, but most of which I can get behind. But then there's the actual execution of it, which isn't always pulling together for me, usually from a writing standpoint, because the production values lately have been phenomenal. And I think all the actors are good in the parts that they have. And some of the scripts I do love, but all the scripts I really love are written by people not named Chris Chibnall because I liked Kerblam and I really liked It Takes You Away and I loved um, Can You Hear Me? And um, Demons of the Punjab was another really good one, but the ones that he actually scripts tend to be the ones that either leave me cold or I end up having the biggest issues with. So I, I guess in my mind, what I kind of wish would happen is if he would take an overseer role, but would stop writing actual episode scripts. Because the, the broad strokes I can get behind, but so many of the specific ep results, episodes that result from it, I just, most of them either leave me cold or unhappy with, some, with a few exceptions that aren't written by him. I, I'd agree to, to quite, a, quite a big extent with that. I think, I don't know, with me, I've just got this sort of, I'm sort of optimistic, which is a, not the best <laughs> thing to have. But I think for me, like, I, I don't, like, not like what Chibnall's doing. It just, some of it works, some of it doesn't. Like, for me, I definitely like it more than quite a few people do, and that's totally fine. I think, um, as a showrunner, I think he is, he's got this sort of refreshing kind of feel to him. I've got my grievances with Moffat, which I'll not go into, like, in too much specifics, but in terms of like gauging what an audience likes and what an audience doesn't like and adapting to that. I feel like Chibnall is, I mean, I know he says he doesn't read reviews. Every show when he reads reviews, of course he does. He's are you telling me he's not going to sit down on a Sunday and go, have a gander on, just well, have that, a quick look. That's like us People saying we don't sure read comments. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, exa well, exactly. Yeah, of course we do. Uh, it's, <laughs> well, you look at the sort of, the main criticisms other than the sort of, you know, more politically stuff, the main sort of criticisms about like Yaz not having much to do in series 11, and, you know, not many returning monsters, not much of a story arc. And then you look at series 12, and it's like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's got a mental health hotline, you know, opinions on that. But we definitely got more old monsters. We definitely got somewhat of a story arc. It's like, I feel like he's listening. And I feel like if we look at the criticisms of series 12, which was admittedly a step up, then are we going to get that step up again for series 13? We're going to look at the issues and then move over. I'm, I'm positive about his era because I believe Chippenhill genuinely does care about the show. It's just never a hundred percent executed to how maybe all of us would want it or appreciate it. For all my criticism, I, I actually agree with the optimism because series twelve mm -hmm. was a notable overall step up from series eleven, yeah. and that's a trajectory that I hope he keeps. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm rooting for the show. I will always root for the show. Yeah, yeah. So I think I, I'm I'm in the minority of preferring series eleven to series twelve. Uh, because it because it, it was more standalone. It felt very ITV drama, which you can either take or leave. But for me, I thought it was a real breath of fresh air. Uh, but uh, Dominic, sorry, you were going to say something. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, no, that's all good. Well, yeah, I'm, I was 
for me, the Chibnall era has so far felt a bit unbalanced because series 11 was, again, as you said, mostly standalone, ep- well, it was all entirely standalone episodes, just with that small furrow line of the fan. Um, but series 12 suddenly just hit the pedal and went full on continuity <laughs> law, bring it back, everything. So we come off the back of series 10 and 9, which were very heavy on the continuity and the uh, nostalgia elements. Uh, 11 be the bre- bre- uh, fresh air, theoretically, and series 12 just going straight even deeper into the law when they go back into Gallifrey. And I just felt that maybe uh, it was perhaps too soon to start diving that far deep if they were going for this whole accessible mm. edge. And uh, some some of the bits that I, I don't think were pulled off entirely successfully. Um, there is merit to the to the two series for sure. Um, as is, as was said, the best episodes I personally believe came from people that weren't Chris Chibnall. But uh, I mm. still do like um, like Spyfall that um, that two part there, and uh, also have to credit him for bringing bringing in a very good master. Mm. Um, but so far on the whole, I can't say I prefer the Chibnall era to Russell or Stephen's entire body of work on the show yet, or up to this point, series one and two, series five and six, it's still third place for me personally. Hmm. Well, so, we, we have no idea like how, how long Chibnall intends to stay. Um, so I, like, I can't base Chibnall's entire era when we've only seen two series so far um but i i'm agreeing with every oh except for mr tartus who puts uh series 11 and, you know, ahead of series 12 because i do like i understand i fully understand but for for me personally like i was thrown into the moffat era like as i said my second episode was the pandora Opens. i love complicated story arcs i love all of that and so for series series 11 for myself personally i was like damn like they, they, there wasn't there wasn't much uh, like of a build up like the the battle of of Ranscor of Colos like is not a finale that I I connect with that much and so when Spyfall can come around That's finale and, and, new who? come uh, on <laughs> what I've seen I'm, I'm I'm taking the I'm joking I'm joking <laughs> you joking um but yeah no so I I feel like um yeah I feel like Chibnall is listening but because I enjoyed series 12 so much more than I expected I would I now have higher hopes for series 13 and I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not. So who knows? But yeah, in, in terms of like um, show running, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure where I'd sit Chibnall just yet because we, we haven't seen all of it. Um, so, so for now, naturally, like I, I'd probably put him at the bottom because, you know, I have so much to work with from the other showrunners. So it's, it's hard to comment on this. Like it's, it's controversial. It, it is midway through, which is worth pointing out. I mean, it's why I won't do uh, like a ranking of where I rank the doctors personally. I won't put Jody in on that ranking until she leaves mm. the part because mm-hmm. I want to see everything she brings to it. And in a way, it's it's we won't be able to properly judge Chibnall until he's gone and he's done everything that he's going to do with it. But there's still two series, so there's still thoughts that we're allowed to have. But I think just with the asterisks of to be amended. Mm. I, don't, I kind of like the surprise element though. I, I think it's a little, just a little side note with that. I think uh, I, I just, I, I don't know, it's, it's such a cheap sort of thing to say with a TV show in terms of quality, but like, I really enjoy just sitting watching series 12 and like every other episode going, wait, whoa, whoa, that, that whoa, I didn't expect that. That's mental. Yeah. Like, like the master and Jack and then Ruth and then like and the Morbius doctors. I mean, like I I get very easily excited over very little things. Um, so it's like yeah, no, I, I find I found a little bit more enjoyment out of that. So I mean, if it's an if it's like a step up from series eleven to twelve, from twelve to thirteen, then I'm excited. I have to say I am excited. I I, can't, I agree that it is surprising, but as far as I'm concerned, the surprises are, uh, are more along the lines of Chris Chibnall showing up at my house and saying, surprise, I filled your PC with beans. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I, I'm probably, I understand that I'm probably going to be going the hardest on his hair, era here of anyone. Mr. Tardis, I agree. 
I much prefer season 11 to season 12 because <laughs> it keeps to itself. I, yeah. it's t it tells its own story, whereas season 12 is going, let's change everything. Yeah. Like, um, I, feel like, I feel like I'd like see season 12 more if, because I described season 12 as like the plot of resurrection of the Daleks, where they've got these incredible plans to conquer the universe, but they do them all at the same time. But if they just did them individually, they might have like won the day. Like Orphan 55 literally ends with one of the characters saying, saying there's too many characters, we can't teleport. And it's mm. not kind of crying for help. Uh, like, and like Fugitive of the Jadoon has got like... 10 different plot threads, and there's too many companions. Great episode, though. Great episode, though. It's all right. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's half of a decent episode, in my humble opinion. I, like, I think I, like, as much as I've like, enjoyed like, Graham and like, Ryan's dynamic with each other, I feel like they were kind of like spare parts in season 12. Like, they kind of didn't really have much in the way of character arcs or anything to do, and oh. it when you have three companions, you have to try and find a way to split them up. You have to try and make them all feel involved. And it kind of detracts from the stories currently being told. Yes. See, I, I, the, one of the reasons I am so hard on this era is because while every era has its bad episodes and its good episodes, I feel that this era has some of the weakest character work. So that even when you get a good episode that works well as a standalone story, like D, uh, Demons of the Punjab, you still have, uh, you don't really have as strong characters to, to relate to as you watch it. You still, you're, you're still seeing the 13th Doctor Who is not, you're not really quite sure who she is yet, but in Erected in the UK, she was talking about giving something a merciful death by letting it starve instead of shooting it quickly. So is she, I don't get her. And yeah, well, while uh, episodes like Kill the Moon make me want to tear my eyes out, I can still watch mm. it for, for the for the characters I know and love, which uh, I can't extend to this series. Well, like I, I the one common because a lot of a lot of times when I find myself criticizing Chibnall's era, I end up not focusing on the stuff that like the loudest detractors tend to shout about. But about the one common criticism that actually I absolutely do share with with Chibnall's era overall is it was a it was a mistake to have three companions and a new doctor yeah. all introduced at the same time. I'm not going to say you can't have that many people in the TARDIS, but given that it was the, our first time meeting Jody, you effectively have four brand new characters, none of whom we know yet. It would have been different if like, if I, if, if I, if I ran the world, we would have, we series 11 would have been Jody, Ryan and Graham. Cause they had the better relationship. I actually really like what they did with Yaz in series 12. So I would have brought her in for series 12, had Ryan and Graham leave at the end of that. And for series 13, have Yaz and the doctor, which they might be doing that last part anyway. But that overcrowdedness is a big part of why you're lacking in those character dynamics that you mentioned, Jay, because there isn't the time to develop them. And it's actually, I think part of the reason I have a hard time, uh, connecting with Davison because he cycled through so many companions and was usually with at least two others. I couldn't find that core relationship that he built with a companion because that's usually a big part of how I key into a doctor. Mm. And Jody's era has kind of lacked to that as well because she hasn't, I don't know which of those relationships is like her defining companion relationship because none of them feel that deep yet. Mm. Yeah. But I don't yeah. think you'd know what any of those companions would be like without the Doctor. I think we need a Doctor Light episode, but if you've only got 10 episodes a season, you, the priorities are different. I think they're kind of setting yeah. themselves up to fail a little bit. You, you don't really understand. If, I, if any of the companions died, it, how would Jodie even react? How, how, quick, how, how, how quick would she be to get over it? Because I could imagine them writing anything from she cries for 10 years to uh, the next day she's found someone new and she's fine. It, it, it's, it's unclear yeah. what they mean to each other. It's, yeah, I, I, I share that. I think the companions are the sort of biggest sort of worry for me and I think the, the level of being, oh, we, they should definitely split up the companions more. The way that they're going to be split up is one of them's probably going to die soon or leave. And I just think, like, and I agree with what you're saying, Jay, in the sense of how, how is that, what's the reaction going to be to that? Ideally, I'd love it if you know, Chibnall played on Geordie's acting strength in terms of a more guilt-focused um, character throughout Series 13, making it sort of play on her a little bit more, make her a darker sort of character, going from this sort of happy-go-lucky lifestyle from Series 11 
slowly arcing into some like one of the darker doctors that i would think that would be interesting but i just don't know if it's gonna go there i would love it if if a companion death and they're not gonna do this i would love it if a companion death was her fault her mistake led to it and that's yeah. that's what leads no. to the next arc. <laughs> I, I i mean i go on record saying that i wish Ryan's dad, and it sounds horrible, but I wish Ryan's dad flew into that sun in resolution because it would have been 13's fault. She was just like, oh, I'll just yeah. open the door. Yeah. I'll shut and the door for a she was, being, she was being so stupid when she did that as well. She said, just stand by the door. We'll push the Dalek out. You'll be fine. <laughs> I'll open it just so it, it's just, it's just big enough. It's just big enough. But it's just like, oh, oh it's gone wrong. Uh, it would have been, if, if he died, then we would have had a whole series of Ryan blaming the doctor for like his dad's actual yeah. death into a sun. <laughs> Yes, and so it could have actually been darker and been like, Ooh, I, That's oh, um, I mean, I'm somebody who uh, didn't think too highly of the way they resolved the <laughs> abandoned father plot anyway. So I feel that they could have yeah. done a lot more of that in terms of having some sort of concrete resolution. So if he actually died in that episode, that would have been fantastic because it wouldn't have given Ryan that chance to have that redemption ribbon. Mm. And so there'd always be that torn up part of the relationship. And it would have yeah. seriously dampened Ryan's character and probably would have had, given the whole Graham and Ryan dynamic, a lot more of a new emotional crux. Yeah, I mean, and, I'm, yeah. Yeah, it's... it's I, I mean, I've, I've went on a couple of four and said that Yaz should have joined the TARDIS team in Resolution and Ryan should have left. So we have a series with Ryan and Graham, we have a series with Graham and Yaz. Less companions, but then, like, for example, like Yaz shows up the moment he fell to Earth or... Um, like arachnids or stuff like when they're on earth have her appear but just miss the TARDIS by a few seconds and lead that into the story a bit more it's just like it just sort of I don't know it, it, the TARDIS is too cramped and it just feels like they had they were so close to having this like really well structured story and they just went no it's all it's all safe he's safe because Ryan forgave him oh. happy no. days don't worry Ryan's it's a sun. really strong microwave <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I find it crazy because um, Broadchurch, the other show that Chris Chibnall was showrunner for, mm. was so unbelievably character driven. And so I'm surprised by the fact that we've had two seasons with these companions and I feel like they're some of the companions I've connected with the least. Like I like them, I genuinely like them and I like the Ryan and Graham relationship and I enjoy that they did more with Yaz. But I'm still shocked as to, you know, in comparison, how little I care about them compared to you know Amy yeah. and Rory and their relationship and stuff like that. So I, I don't know. Sure. We'll we'll see we'll see what happens at Christmas or New Year's or whenever whenever it comes back. Um, um uh, Paul and Jason, do you guys have anything to add? No, no I agree with a lot of what's being said there. Actually, there's been a really <laughs> interesting discussion back and forth. Um, there's nothing that I really would disagree with. I think there's some very sound logic in there. It's really good. Um, guys, I have to dash, unfortunately, because I'm due back on a live feed on YouTube in about three minutes. Um, <laughs> I'm cut out of a live event to come and join you guys tonight. I think this is a great conversation. Um, I think it's been good to be a part of it. And if I can get a recording afterwards, that'll be really interesting. Thank, thanks so much for, for coming out. No worries. Thanks for that. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Uh, but if I could say one thing in like the yeah. Chibnall era's favour, in my opinion, I don't know if everyone else agrees, but I personally really love the way he characterises his villains. I think some of the stories they could be in could be more interesting, but I love his depiction of this sarcastic, sardonic Dalek in Resolution, which yeah. gives the military a three-second warning, um, <laughs> which is yeah. which is an yeah. absolute throwback to the petty... Terry Nation Daleks of the 60s. I love Ashard, the lone side man. I just wish he was in a better story. Um, Tim I Shaw was still alive. Was, was at least, <laughs> Tim Shaw yeah. was at least like, well performed by Samuel Oakley. I think that was the actor's name. And I like the creepy tooth face concept. And I also think that this master is the most interesting of the revived series. Mm. Uh, I, I think there's absolutely merit to John Sims and Michelle Gomez's interpretation, but Sasha Darwin is co utterly compelling to watch. Like this fractured, broken character who he almost seems on the verge of tears every time he's on screen. <laughs> uh, and that's both really frightening, but also really like it, you, you kind of pity him a little bit as well. And it's such an interesting doctor master relationship. And I, I, and I, I think that he does villains really, really well. 
I, mm. I think this master in a lot of ways is what I wanted the John Sim master to be, but wasn't quite. Um, although, although I'll put my hand up, I still prefer Missy, but I, <laughs> I do, I do really like what he's brought and cause it takes that sort of fractured psyche that Sim had an element of but it never worked for me because a lot of the time it came across as almost cartoonish and like he was bouncing off the walls because he needed Ritalin whereas with this current master yeah he's bouncing off the walls but it feels more like if he stopped bouncing off the walls he might break down at any moment mm -hmm. and that that's a vibe I, I can get behind. I feel like if John Sim had like such a script he would have been like he would have been equally as good of a master like I, th I feel Again, I think Sim was used in, uh, beyond series three, I think Sim was kind of a little bit like shafted in the way he was used in terms of like the end of time with the whole flying, eating people thing. Um, See, I'm in, I'm in the minority on that because I actually prefer Ooh. his master in that versus series. Again, he's again, he's not, great in that. It's just the powers and stuff and the lightning and the... the uh, you can argue the writing. I find his performance a lot more compelling in yeah. the end of time. Right? Yeah. That's true, yeah, I, I think. But then the, the Doctor Falls, I, th I feel like he was just sort of in there and didn't really do anything and then got stabbed. What Sasha the one is sort of, he's, I feel like he really balances that. And I think it is down to the script as well as the performance in sense of balancing that um, sort of craziness with this sort of genuine, like, genuine sort of emotion in his character. Like, there's, there's proper feelings there um, towards the Doctor, whether that be positive or negative a lot of the time. It's very interesting to look at that and explore that. And I'm actually excited to see more of him. Mm. Yeah, get the general vibe that he's very much um, the des the most desperate version of the character after oh, undergoing yeah. that complete revelation that he's endured. But he's now just completely unable to know how to cope. So if he's after Missy, he's just gone back into what he believes comes naturally to him, mm. and for better or for worse, really, because he's just he's just clearly extremely torn up, and in a sense, he still needs the doctor as even as that very, very twisted, loose friendship that they have, but mm. even to the extent of just going to doing all sorts of things just to catch attention. But Sasha, the way Sasha plays the role is just exemplary. And uh, yeah, it, it's just, I would say a terrifying performance, I'd say, because again, this was said, he's nearly on the verge of breaking down every time you see him. So mm. yeah, yeah extremely well played, probably my favorite master insanely. George, say if we're all, if we're all uh, I, I do feel that it's a disservice to have him so soon after, uh, uh, would you spoil this for season 10? Is that allowed? The thing that would spoil, the thing that we would spoil in season 10, that it would be a disservice to have him so soon after. I feel that the relationship between 12 and, uh, and Missy and, and, and John Sims master being brought into that is, um, is done a disservice by having the character come back so soon after that arc is completed with no real reference in any way to that arc um and, and you, you see jody there and you know her most re she's met this character very recently and had a profoundly i guess emotional experience with them but you don't none of that really seems to influence their current dynamic which mm. is the main issue i take with it I, i've heard I have that to be the unpopular one in the room and so i don't particularly like well, it either I've, I've heard that criticism before and I, I get why people have it, but the way I square that circle is that it depends on whether or not you take it as a given that the Sasha Dewan master is the one immediately following Missy, which is not in evidence right now. That's the natural assumption, but we don't know where this master fits in his timeline. He could theoretically be earlier. He could be several regenerations later, not even the one immediately <laughs> after. And that wiggle room, which is actually something I really appreciate when Doctor Who does, like the example I will always use, I, even though I know who he says it was, I will always thank mm -hmm. Russell T. Davies for not identifying who the older woman in the end of time was so that I can have my head cannon and no one can tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> so having that wiggle room, which I do think at least currently, as we understand this master, there is, it gives me the freedom to not feel like it undoes Missy because I don't know that he comes immediately after Missy. I agree I that that fixes it yeah. for, for, I, for that art, for him, but I feel that um, the doctor should have a different outlook on it. Um, yeah. 
I, I'm fine yeah. with him being there, but I feel like she I think, should care. Where do you fit in? Are you the one that I helped to get better? And you've just yeah. completely thrown it all away? Like, I feel I, she should be freaking out about that. But. I think I, I, I understand that. I think it's in sense of the audience as well as like it was only two series ago. I feel I, I always said the best time of being the master back would have been series 13 if it's 2021, 50 years since Terror of the Autons, you know, bringing back in an Auton story. That would have been great. But I think I think the audience and maybe the Doctor, it's too soon and it's not mentioned. For me, I don't mind whether it comes before or after Missy because the whole timeless child thing and the whole thing about going through the Matrix and finding that out, you know, love or hate it, it's very, I think it's very justified in the sense of what the Master found out about the Doctor and his reasoning towards just totally snapping, whether that's before or after the redemption. But I totally agree with what you're saying about the Doctor not even questioning it. I feel like you know, Doctor Who obviously does change a lot through different eras and different showrunners and writers, but to at least address it would have been nice. Doesn't, yeah. well, it doesn't matter whether it's a, we actually find out where this incarnation comes, just the Doctor questioning it, maybe, and then Sasha just going, don't care, I'm not yeah. gonna, or, just, or just lying, you know? It, it, I feel like something, anything would have been just a little bit more conclusive. Yeah, and I, I think, think even... Like that. Sorry, go on. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, even a throwaway line to that regard probably mm, would have helped yeah. soften the blow, like saying, I thought we were getting somewhere, I thought I helped you. And him being like, nah, as you said, but yeah, I think that, I, but as I said, there is that wriggle room, so we'll, we'll see. But for the Doctor's perspective, yeah, it did seem a little bit like, oh, she gave up instantly then. Saw him again, ah, oh, right, well, that's done. Yeah. I have to agree that it would be great if... Um, if she asked him where he fit in and he refused to answer and that was driving her mental, I would love to see that. Yeah. That, that I would totally buy because I, it, I, I do think that's a very valid complaint that she hasn't even asked the question. And also I would have seen that for her to ask, mm. where is all this coming from? And he just won't tell her because he knows it'll bug her. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I like it. It's, it's not about finding out where he, where he comes. It's about at least having it acknowledged that... It, it, it's not, yeah, it's not just totally forgotten about. It's, it's caring enough to ask the question, even if we don't get an answer, which honestly, I don't need an answer. But yeah, yeah, yeah the question yeah. should have been asked. I will say that I think, though, as a writer, you'd be damned if you do, damned if you don't. Because if you do have yeah. to stop the story to ask that question, you're immediately tethering that to something that happened years ago that maybe some of the audience haven't even watched. Or mm. you're immediately mm. associating that moment, that character, with something that happened years ago. I, 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 do, I, I think you're damned yeah. if you do, damned if you don't. There's merit I, to that. Uh, I, I'd agree. And I would always, I've always been on record in saying it's not the job of a showrunner to clean up the previous showrunner's mess. Whether or not, I'm not saying it was a mess. I'm just saying in general, it's just mm. as a general sort of rule of thumb. Like, it's not Chibnall's responsibility to answer what the hybrid thing was all about and what, you know, mm. clean up the whole Gallifrey thing. You know, he just sort of did his own thing. And I respect yeah. that. But at the same time, yeah, I, I sort of, I get what you're saying because it's, sort of, it's, a, it's a new audience and you can't really, yeah, that's a difficult one, I suppose. But yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess they wanted to reintroduce the master as a proper full on villain again. So they're probably just best to just try and pull, pull the cover over and, uh, just go straight in from that regard, really, mm -hmm. as much as we as fans might have liked that little bit of continuity. But I guess they were trying to just go for that general mm -hmm. clean slate. Yeah, it's also like the controversy with the, the timeless child revelations mm. and everything. I, if you, you could love it, it could tell some great stories in the next few years. Give it five or six years and it will not be canon anymore. That's like, exactly for, it. like, exactly. Like, there's a load of stuff from the Stephen Moffat era, like the Doctor ridding the universe of death at the end of Hellbent, um, and a load of other mm. like universe-altering stuff, which what you ignore can't can't hurt you. Uh -huh, and, that, and if you don't like the Timeless Child, fair enough, and you can just the next showrunner can just not acknowledge it, and it can they can pave their own path. They can change the continuity in their own way. Well, that, that's. Think yeah that's part of the adaptability of the show inherently is that and actually this is something that i've really appreciated what the show has done because george ace creeper is absolutely right that not only is it not the job of a showrunner to correct or undo or whatever what the previous runners did thankfully that really hasn't happened um in in the modern era so far whatever you think about chibnall i don't feel like any of his decisions are him trying to fix or amend or even undo so here's the thing 
Timeless Child, I'm going to touch on it super lightly. I don't hate the concept. <laughs> I hate that it's the doctor. I wish that the Timeless Child was literally anyone else other than the doctor. But, and, and, and I, like, I deeply hate that. And I don't want stories to come of that. But I don't, I also don't want Chibnall or whoever comes after him to somehow retcon it as not being there. I would rather let him do whatever he's going to do with it. And whoever comes in next will do their own thing. Nobody should be tying up what they're going to do with the show because of problems with before just move on, yeah. which largely the show has done. And that's what I love about it. It doesn't make the comic book universe mistake of constantly trying to retcon things. It just mm. stops talking about them, mm. which is the much better way to move forward. Mm. Of, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's certainly a hot take, but I, I don't necessarily mind it. I think it, I can totally understand why people like really don't. But I think there's just something about the whole. I, I mean, I, I went on record when the rumor about pre Hartnell doctors was a thing before series twelve. I was like, I'm going to stop watching if they do that. But then they did it, and I'm like, actually. Maybe it's because we saw Philip Hinchcliffe, uh, Philip Hinchcliffe canonizes the Doctor. Maybe I was just like, "Yeah, that's great." But um, I, you know, I, I kind of, I kind of like it. It just depends on where they take it. The whole idea of the Doctor working for the Division, this secret sort of Time Lord thing. If they bring in next series and bring in like Tectoon again and, and show us more of this era, have Ruth again in this next series as like a prominent figure, this sort of two Doctors type thing. I. It's different, and I kind of like it. You know, it's a very different direction. And yeah, sure, it's a very bold decision to make, especially when the next series probably isn't going to be for another year and a half. But it's, I kind of, in, I think in retrospect, like if, if, when we get to like series 14, series 15, and we look back, like if you just finish series 12 and start series 13, I think it'd be like, actually, maybe, maybe it does work a little bit better when you can sort of see where they're going with it. I'm sure Chibnall's got an idea and a plan, hopefully. Because if that's just there and then they totally ignore that, I'll be a little bit like, ah, oh, you see, that so, now I don't like it. I'd really I, like them to play so, out with it a bit more. Um, so unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming. I, I, I know there, there, there's so much there and there's still like this could go on for like another hour. Um, oh, Doctor Who fans could talk for it for days. Oh, just oh, yeah. a timeless child. Yeah. Let's all gather again sometime. <laughs> yeah, uh, for for sure. If I'm doing any other panels, I'll be sure to I'll be sure to hit you guys up. Um, if if everyone if anyone wants to put their um, like their YouTube channel or uh, what, what, whatever they want to promote in the chat, um, you can do that. Just just if, if people watching want to uh, want to subscribe to you or whatever. Um, so thank, thank you guys so much. I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, thanks so much for having us all. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. There's, there's, one thing there's one thing I've got to say though real quick, because Councillor Geeks, when you first came on and you said that you first watched up to because of the Satan pits, because you saw an ood, was Paul <laughs> that ood? Yeah, so I play New Sigma, yeah. So there we so go. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I, I I owe my fandom to you, Paul. Thank you. Oh, my God. That's a pleasure. Do you know what? It was truly... I loved listening to you all. I was mesmerized by how passionate you all are about the show. It's amazing. <laughs> it truly is. I appreciate it. You do, you do, you're doing good work. Great work. You've done amazing work. Thank you for being all those monsters over the years, no matter how Please. much <laughs> you must have uh, leaked out over them. Thank you for all the nightmare fuel. In a good way. <laughs> That's always a pleasure. Thank you guys for doing the panel. It was so interesting. And if you guys want to do it again, we're trying to host more sessions in the future. So let us know. Um, it looks like a lot of people were really excited. And we also streamed it as well and got good feedback on there. Nice. And I have when, a recording for you. Next, um, Webcon. Uh, after uh, after some days, I mean. Um. So we're still trying to figure that out. It might be towards the end of June, but we're gonna probably do mini sessions where people can just have like not a full schedule, but like just two or three go panels going on at once. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much, guys. Yeah, I'll be. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, everyone. I'll be in touch with you about that one. Uh, I, I'm assuming a lot of you guys wanna would 